Russian novelist Tolstoy used to remind us that all great literature begin with one of two storylines. A stranger comes to town, a man begins a long journey. Hello everyone and welcome to the Wizards of the Lal Street, a fresh breeze. I'm Ramesh Damani, coming to you from Old Calcutta in central Mumbai. With me today to discuss the language and grammar of stock markets is the CIO and director at Parag Parikh Mutual Fund, Rajiv Thakkar. Rajiv, welcome to Wizards. Thank you for having me. Pleasure being here. It's great. Rajiv, let me start you in 2003. You were in the fixed income side of things and you had this aha moment. What was it about? Sure. So, I started my career in financial markets in 94. In 94 to 2003, I was something like a jack of all trades. Investment banking, corporate finance, bonds, various IPOs. things. IPOs. Yes. Uh, 2003, some colleagues of mine, myself, Parag Bhai, we were sitting together and discussing stuff. And the people in charge of client investments, they said, we have had a terrific run in bonds. We have made north of 20% on our bond funds. And 10-year government bond yield had fallen from 14% to around 5% at that point in time. Inflation had come down, interest rates had come down, so bond values had uh, risen dramatically at that time. That's correct. So I said, good for you, it's been a great run, but have you thought about what happens in the future? Like bond yields are already at 5%. Even if they stabilize here, we'll make 5 minus the fund management charge 1%, say 4% per annum. Uh, whereas equities are yielding you 10% plus in some cases, 0 under 180 rupees, 18 rupee dividend per share, also growing. So, why are you still in bonds? So, that was a collective aha moment for the firm and we said that allocations need to change. So, they put you into equities? At that they time? did. They said that uh, this is something interesting that you are saying. If you are so convinced, come with us, talk to clients and let's get money in equities rather than to manage rather than bonds. It is of course extremely rare for equities to yield more than bonds. Typically the re relationship has been the reverse. Uh, but all these good fortune of high yieldings got caught up in a bull market. But by 2007, uh, value had disappeared? Value was still there in pockets, but that was not what was moving. So 2007 was extremely difficult for us. Uh, the stocks that were moving were from commodities, uh, commodity companies, they were from infrastructure companies and we had listings of DLF and you had Unitech, Kinnarana and all the other real estate developers. And we were not participating in either of the three sectors. We had a huge underperformance on hand and some of the newer clients were jittery, in turn some of our RMs were jittery. That was the time when Paraguay stood behind us saying, we will do what we understand, we will not uh, get swayed by what is popular and if someone wants to redeem, so be it. You took the call, if they want to redeem, you let them redeem. Yes, we <laughs> let them redeem. <laughs> it's very rare thinking in a mutual fund industry. But uh, let me talk about your founders. I know there are two people who have had a disproportionate influence on the way stocks are selected. Talk to me about these two people and how did they influence you and is there a continuing influence that you feel every day? 2001 when I joined uh, this company and 2003 when I moved to equities. Uh, between that period, we had good conversations with Mr. Chandrakant Sampath. Now, he was the person who uh, brought forth the merits of looking at quality rather than Chandrakan just... Chandrakant Sampath, just for, for my viewers, was the, almost the dean of value investing in India. Go ahead. That is correct. So, uh, he was the person who... Uh, brought to light the importance of quality, quality in terms of quality of management, uh, quality of the business in terms of entry barriers, moats, and also the capital efficiency part where the company needs to generate high and sustainable ROE rather than uh, just go on creating fixed assets and earning subpar returns. Asset light models. Asset light models was what he loved. He taught you that. What did Parag Parik teach you? Parag Parik is an author on behavioral finance, he's lectured various places, he's read probably everything that is there in terms of research on behavioral finance and he taught the importance of psychology in valuing equities. But in 2010, uh, looking ahead, you had another of what has now become famous in your firm, another aha moment. What was that moment about? So, the things that we had bought in 2007, 8, 9, things like... Uh, FMCG stocks, pharma stocks, some IT companies, they came into fancy and 
from undervalued to fairly valued to what we thought at that time somewhat overvalued. Of course, they went up even after we sold a bit. So, we started lightening up on those companies, those sectors and we were left with cash. What was puzzling was that Indian companies were trading at very expensive valuations, what some would call the, uh, nosebleed valuations, whereas the parent companies abroad were trading cheap. Very modest. So, uh, 3M for example in India was at a triple digit P, whereas the parent would trade at somewhere about 15-16 times earnings. So, that is when we started exploring investing in overseas stocks. You know, they say uh, necessity is the mother of invention. So, here you have a PMS structure, it was hard to express yourself in foreign stocks. So, you decided to convert your PMS then into a mutual fund. Why did you do that? So, under PMS, there is no provision to manage foreign equity investments under the RBI liberalized right. remittance scheme. RBI allows it, but under SEBI, we can't manage it. So, we were sending research to clients, they were executing the trades, but we were not able to manage client investments. We would have been able to do that if we were ha having a mutual fund structure. So, that was one of the reasons to look at a fund structure. Also, onboarding clients, accounting and taxation wise simplicity, various factors led us to apply for a mutual fund license and 2013 is when we shifted to the fund structure. So, now an Indian investor can be truly diversified uh, across countries also with this structure. True. What it does is, it opens up avenues at the same time volatility comes down. So, for example, this demonetization thing affects the Indian component. It does not affect the overseas. So, of course. the portfolio volatility also comes down dramatically when this happens. Interesting point. Uh, Let us talk about some of the stocks that you <coughs> have pioneered, the foreign stocks, international stocks that you have pioneered. The one that caught your eye very early on was, you know, Google uh, and now it is offshoot Alphabet. What got you interested in that stock? So, it was 2011, uh, I was at the Berkshire meet and Charlie Munger was asked, what is the most significant thing that you read in the last year? And he wistfully looked at the person asking the question, said, probably I will never get to use it in my investing, but it is amazing what these engineering cultures are doing uh, in terms of changing the world and creating values. And he was referring to the book. In the Plex, which the story of Google, the story of Google, and Google Plex is where they create all this magic. Yes. So uh, immediately after the meet got over, got onto the Kindle, downloaded the book, uh, and went through it. And it's actually amazing the kind of things that they have done to create a moat and to have this kind of advantage in so many products. They are the number one, and the number two is a very distant player. Whether it's search engine, whether it is email, Mail, search, uh, YouTube, maps, maps, YouTube, uh, Android. So, uh, the kind of moat is amazing and all these products work together. And, and yet, it was cheap. Yes, it was much cheaper than some of the FMCG pharma names that we had sold. So, it was somewhere about 17 times earnings when we bought it net of cash. But, uh, give me an example of something domestically where you put all your learnings together from your founders, from yourself and express it in the form of a stock. So, we own Zydus Wellness for example. Sugar free guys. Sugar free guys. Sugar free, uh, ever youth face pack and things like that. So, these guys are into <laughs> selling products which are substitutes. Uh, so, sugar free is a substitute for sugar and Neutralite is a substitute for oh, butter. butter. So, anyone who gets diagnosed with a sugar condition or with cholesterol problem becomes a customer more likely than not and then stays on as a customer for life. It is a very so, sticky uh, it's a habit. sticky kind of business and again they have huge market shares in sugar free for example their market share is north of 90 percent. So, uh, looks interesting uh, and given that a lot of people have these conditions but are not diagnosed. So, as in when people start figuring out that they have health issues you could see the customer base growing. I know your life changed on May 3rd, 2015. Tell me what happened on that horrific day. So, we had uh, gone for the Berkshire meeting, Parag Bhai, Gita Bhavi, myself and my colleagues. Almost like uh, an annual pilgrimage uh, for you guys. Yeah, and my colleague Ronak. So, the meeting was over on Saturday and this was Sunday morning. Uh, we were going to drop Parag Bhai and Bhavi to the airport 
they were flying out to San Francisco. And on the way, we met with an accident. Uh, we passed away in that. Gita Babi was severely injured. One of the darkest days of the last three that I've seen because uh, he was always a part of our lives, friend, acquaintance, colleague, and passed away in an instant. But how do you continue the legacy of Parag? I mean, have you? Is there something that uh, you've learned from him that you imbibe in your new colleagues almost every day? So, luckily for us, the uh, staff turnover has been extremely limited. People who have been with us have been with us for decades, um, not just one or two years. So, I have been here 15 years now and a lot of other people have been around for long. Neil, his son has been there more than 10 years now. DNA is already a part of that firm. DNA is there and uh, once he crossed 60, uh, he had started transitioning in the sense uh, he was not hands-on in a lot of areas, he was mentoring people, uh, he was looking at his golf, travel, spiritual side and he was building an organization where people can function on their own. So, that stood us in good stead. Rajiv, thank you so much for being a part of our show and dropping by to chat with us. Thank you for having me.